Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you to the panel. It's outrageous that this sort of government-made catastrophe would happen anywhere in the United States. And I agree with my Democratic colleagues that we need an independent, nonpartisan investigation. The state of Michigan needs to provide comprehensive assistance to the people of Flint. And the state has the resources. I can assure you that as a former state legislator. The state spends $33 million on the Pure Michigan ad campaign, yet has provided only $28 million to make sure that the people of Flint have pure water. So the state has the resources. The state needs to make it right. I've never liked the emergency manager law. It takes power away from the people of the community. It's disappointing that uh, former emergency manager Early uh, had his attorney tell us uh, when he received the subpoena for his attendance here that it borders on nonsensical to accept that subpoena to come here. Uh, what's nonsensical, what's disappointing is that one of the people who is uh, probably most culpable for the situation won't take responsibility for it. And uh, I think he needs to appear here and uh, I'd like to uh, have some more people uh, here and it's, it's unfortunate that we uh, well, this is an esteemed panel that we only have the, the four of you. So my uh, first question is for Mr. Cray. And uh, Ms. Lawrence touched on this. Uh, what role does the Michigan DEQ have in implementing and enforcing safe drinking water standards? I just want to uh, get to the bottom of it. Is it the primary role? Yes, we have a primary role to oversee compliance with the Safe Drinking Water Act and lead and copper rule. What role does the Michigan DEQ have in the process of bringing a water treatment plant back online? It's my understanding that the Flint uh, treatment plant was offline for a long period of time. Actually, the Flint tree, uh, treatment plant has a long history. Um, it was a primary source, I believe, before 1967. I think it's been in existence since 1903. I think it's been a backup. I think it's um, tested on a quarterly basis to assure it meets drink, safe drinking water standards. And so it was going from a backup to a primary. Actually, state law does not require additional permits for that to occur in and of itself. So what, what role do the DEQ have, the Michigan DEQ have in, in that process? Of bringing it back online? Uh, they would apply to us to get permits for modifications to the plant. And when a city decides to change its uh, water source, how involved is the Michigan DEQ? I think as Ben mentioned, it's highly unusual across this country to go from one water source to another. And so the rigor should have been more when the water source changed. My, uh, my next question is for uh, Professor Edwards. Uh, we know that not enough phosphates were added uh, to the water to make it less corrosive. Uh, what's the cost of uh, treating the water with the appropriate amount of phosphates? When the switch was made, there was actually no phosphate added at all. There was no corrosion control. Uh, federal law was not followed. No phosphates at, at all? Nothing. Had, had they done the minimum allowable under the law, which would have been to continue the phosphate dosing, which would have been uh, in Detroit water, it would have cost 80 to $100 a day. Uh, do you know why or why do you think uh, no phosphates were added? Isn't that a normal step you take if you were running a, a, a facility? It, it's the law. Uh, you have to have a corrosion control plan, uh, and that's, that's why we have the law. This disaster would not have occurred if, if the phosphate had been added, and that includes the, you know, the Legionella uh, likely outbreak, the red water that you see, uh, the leaks of the plumbing system. In general, corrosion control, for every dollar you spend on it, you save $10, but in Flint's situation, for every dollar they would have spent on it, they would have easily saved $1,000. So my only uh, explanation is that 
it probably did start innocently in the chaos of the turnover and someone simply forgot to follow the law. And, and not including the phosphates is a problem regardless of the water source, whether it was the Flint River or some other water source? Well, you don't have to use phosphate. There are alternative approaches that one can use, including pH and alkalinity adjustment. But the key point is you have to have a plan and you're supposed to be optimizing it to make sure that you're protecting your pipes, you're protecting your people. And if you started to uh, send these phosphates or other uh, uh, chemicals through the water to fix the problem, how long would it take? Uh, well, it's, it's quite likely that right now, even after a few months of phosphate dosing, that the coating has been largely restored and that if a federally approved lead and copper oil sampling was done today, there's a, a pretty good chance that Flint would pass, I can't say. But until they actually do that testing, we have to err on the side of caution and assume that the water is not safe to drink. Flint has never done a lead and copper oil testing according to federal regulations, like many cities across the United States. And the reason is they never did the first step that was required under the rule uh, in 1997, which is to identify high-risk homes from which you have to sample. Uh, what's become clear in Flint is they've, they've never followed that first step and therefore, frankly, all of their prior sampling results are invalid. Thanks for your testimony. My time's expired.